Welcome to First Federated Church's online video podcast of this week's sermon. First Federated Church is based out of Des Moines, Iowa. Please visit www.firstfederated.org for more information. If you brought uh, your Bibles with you today, won't you turn to Hebrews chapter 11? And let me just start off by saying that there are many places in the Bible, if you want to know something specific about a certain topic, there are many go-to passages in the Bible. I think I recorded those on your note guide. They're up on the screen. For example, if you want to know about love, there's many places you can find it in the Scripture, but 1 Corinthians 13 will really immerse you into the topic. If you want to know about the foundation of the gospel, what is the irreducible minimum of the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. If you want to know about the resurrection, and why a resurrection is necessary and how the resurrection will work one day, then 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 58 will help you understand that. Of course, Matthew 28, 18 through 20 talks about the church's mission. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18 lays out a compelling case of who Jesus really is. And if you want to know about faith, then the passage you're turning to now is the go-to place. And that is going to be the foundation of our series titled Faith Living Beyond What I Can See. We want to begin to learn how to walk in faith, live by faith, so that we can see beyond the everyday issues of life and see into what God has for us and be able to walk and navigate through the difficulties of life knowing where God is taking us. So I hope that you'll be along for the ride. It's going to be about 10 weeks long. Also, many of us want to know where the series is going. I put that on the note guide as well. But just in case you didn't pick one up, let me quickly review it with three different screens up here. Today, we're going to define faith, what it is, what it isn't. Hopefully, by the time we're done, you'll have a good idea about that. Next week, we'll come talking about the necessity of faith. Is it absolutely crucial to our walk with Christ? We'll answer that question next week. We'll begin then to look at some examples of faith. We're going to look at Abraham and his faith to follow and faith to trust. Moses, his faith to resist temptation and his faith to lead uh, against insurmountable odds. We'll look at Joshua and Rahab, the faith to do it God's way, the faith to embrace an enemy. And then we'll look at Gideon and the face, the faith to face ridiculous odds, the faith to follow a ridiculous plan. As I think about those two with the word ridiculous in them, I'm reminded of a series I did years ago at my former church in Ohio where I titled the series Our Unreasonable God. And I spent four or five weeks going through several Old Testament passages showing our congregation how God often operates in the realm of unreasonableness. In other words, he asks of us to do what we would naturally say, that's unreasonable. You shouldn't ask that of us, God. That's absolutely impossible. And he says, absolutely, that's right. I want you to trust me to take you through it. And so that's kind of uh, harking back to some of that years and years ago. On uh, the 20th of November, we'll be... uh, pausing with the series for our Thanksgiving celebration. That's going to be a one-service day. Don't worry about it right now. We'll talk about how all that's going to work when we get closer, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm claiming that by faith, David. You're looking at me a little bit strange. But anyway, so then November the 27th, that also might be a one-service day. We'll just have to wait and see how much turkey we've all taken in and how much resilience we have at the end of the week. But uh, we're going to be looking at faith from the perspective of what is tangible, what is intangible. And then we'll kind of get a little bit into the Christmas theme, looking at Joseph and his faith to be able to follow his dream. Now listen, that's a little bit tricky title. I'll explain it to you when we get there. Don't worry about it till then. Then we'll look at Mary and her faith to be able to accept a life-altering, history-changing divine assignment. And then on the 18th, we'll conclude the series by looking at Jesus and his faith. And yes, even Jesus had faith. He has faith. He is faith. And uh, faith to be the centerpiece of God's eternal plan. So there you have it. That's the uh, faith series. In a nutshell, of course, as always, I reserve the right to make adaptations and changes as needed. But for now, that's the path. That's, the, uh, that's the, where we're going to be walking over the next uh, 10 years weeks. So Hebrews chapter 11. Now today is the only time I'm going to be reading the full uh, passage um, all in one setting. We'll keep referring back to it because this is where the series is coming from. 
But today I want us to catch it all together in one big snapshot. So if you have your Bible, turn there. If you've got your, uh, your iPad or your, uh, your phone, uh, just punch that up. And here we go. I'm reading from the English Standard Version, or you can just follow along on the screen, whichever fits best for you. Verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation by faith. We understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him, that is God, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, In reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age since she considered him, that is God, faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of the sand by the seashore. This is an important statement here. These all died in faith not having received the things promised. I just want to stop there for a minute because I just think that's such a pivotal statement. I mean, here we're celebrating these people and their faith and and how great faith is, and then all of a sudden we run headlong into a statement that says, and they died not receiving the things promised. Oh, that's not good, is it? Hmm. It goes on to say, but having seen them and greeted them from afar. Hmm. And having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had not been thinking, if they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. We'll talk more about that down the road. But as it is, they desired or desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city by faith. Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promise was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it is said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And how can offspring come if the one you're being given is dead? Verse 19 but he considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, which, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessing on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He was considered... uh, He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt... 
Not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him, that is God, who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. By faith, the people, speaking of the people of Israel, crossed the Red Sea as on dry land. But the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they'd been encircled for seven days. That's all up into the issue of Joshua there. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed uh, with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world is not worthy. Wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And now we come to the second statement of having been promised and not received. Notice verse 39. And all these, though commended through faith, through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Why? Why? Since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Before I finish up, let me just say, wow, isn't that interesting? So these people were made, God made promises to them. They received those promises through faith. They lived in faith. They died in faith. They did not physically grab hold of those things and possess them. Why? It would seem as though there is something that God is doing that connects those people thousands of years ago to the people who are living right now. We'll talk about that later, right? But there's some connection so that they did not fully grasp physically because we had to be brought in to the mix as well. I would encourage you to, you got quite a few weeks before we get there. Look that up. See what that might be all about. Chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Father, I'm asking that you would bless the reading of your word to us today. And in this first message on the series of faith, your spirit would communicate to us all what it is, what it isn't. Help us to walk away with clarity about the nature of biblical faith. Bring us back week after week to continue to learn about faith and to grow in our own faith, to be able to be well-pleasing in your sight as men and women and young people of faith. For my brothers and sisters in Christ, encourage them, as many of them, their faith is taking a beating. And for those who have yet to believe, I pray that your Holy Spirit will draw them 
to that place of faith, open that gift of faith, open the door of faith that they may believe and become part of the family of God, part of the kingdom of God. And as you do these things, we will rejoice and be glad in what you are doing to glorify your name and benefit many people. I praise you and I thank you for this opportunity in Jesus' name, amen. So, I ask, did you get the count? Did you get the count? Okay, well, let me give it to you. 27, that's the count. 27 times in this section of scripture, faith is referenced. 27 times, that's a lot. Must be important, let's define it. What is faith? We go right to verse one. Now, faith is. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It is the conviction of things not seen. Got it? Good. Let's close. No. No. Uh, I don't think we've got it quite just yet. That's a good definition, but you know what? There's a lot there that if we don't dig into it, we don't really grasp or understand. We walk away as foggy as we walked in. So let's talk about it. We'll break those two sentences down, those two phrases down. First, assurance of things hoped for. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Let's talk about hope. There's two ways that hope is used. Uh, There's the general way that we use hope in our everyday language and conversation. Let's define that. When we use hope in our normal everyday conversation, we are usually uh, using it uh, to represent desire for something without assurance of a confident outcome. Uh, I say I hope in this or I hope for that. It is expressing a desire for something without assurance of a confident outcome. Let me illustrate that. I hope the Hawkeyes will have an undefeated season, right? That's, that's my hope. I hope the Hawkeyes will have an undefeated season, albeit we are now into the season and we know that that's not going to happen. Therefore, as they say, our hopes have been dashed, those of us who want to see that happen. But this is just an illustration, right? So I hope the Hawkeyes will have an undefeated season. When I say hope in that context, what am I communicating? I'm communicating these three thoughts. Number one, this is what I want to see. I'm expressing what I want to see become reality. I'm also expressing something that I think theoretically is possible because why would I hope for something if it had absolutely no possibility whatsoever? So theoretically, I know it is possible. And I really do believe that theoretically that them having an undefeated season, and I mean all the way to the end, the national championship, the whole nine yards, right? It's theoretically possible, but not very probable, okay? But that's just the way it is. But it's theoretically possible. But even though it's theoretically possible, I have no reason to base my life on that hope because the outcome is just so uncertain. In other words, there's no definitive reason for me to believe that it absolutely will happen. So what do I do? I hope, which means I wish, which means I dream, but it's not certain. And that's the way we typically use the word hope when we're talking in everyday life. That is not the way hope is being utilized here in this context. The biblical usage in this context is expressing a desire for something with assurance of a confident outcome. Illustration. I hope in eternal life with Jesus Christ. And when I say that, I hope as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus myself, when I say I hope in eternal life with Jesus Christ, what am I communicating? I'm saying just like I was before, that I want to see this happen. I want my life to, my earthly life to come to a close that is ushering in then eternal life in the presence of God with Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. I I want to see that happen. There there now begins to be a difference because I'm not just thinking it's theoretically possible. I'm actually standing today on a platform that says it is absolutely going to happen. It is absolutely possible. And therefore, I have reason to base my life on that hope because the outcome, as I understand it and see it, is absolutely certain. What I'm saying to you is that there are definitive reasons for me to believe that my life will end on earth 
with eternal life in heaven with Jesus Christ. It will happen. Now, before I tell you the definitive reasons why I believe that, let me just draw a conclusion between these two perspectives of hope. The difference between these two perspectives is simply this. It is the foundation upon which my hope is laid. You see, when I talk about the Hawkeyes having an undefeated season, my hope is built on the vacillating abilities and circumstances. The word vacillating is important there. The vacillating abilities and circumstances that hold sway over coaches and players and officials, even the the fickleness, the vacillating realities of weather, right? If you were watching football yesterday afternoon, you might have been turning back and forth between the Hawkeyes, the Cyclones, and the game that was going on on the East Coast that was a slud, what was it, a slosh fest. It was because of the Hurricane Matthew. There was, I mean, the the field was just full of water and it was just mud and muck everywhere. I mean, you can't count on it, right? You can't count that the coaches are always going to bring their A game. You can't count on the players always being healthy and in good shape. You can't count on the officials to always make the right call. You can't even count on the weather to be favorable towards you. And so there's this vacillating thing that this hope that the Hawkeyes will have an undefeated season, that it all hinges on all that stuff, including Vanderberg and his injury and whatever, right? I mean, at least give me some kind of indication you're with me this morning. You got it? Okay, good. Fantastic. But when I say I hope in eternal life with Jesus Christ, then hope is built on the unwavering knowledge, power, and presence of Jesus Christ. His knowledge, his power, his eternal presence It never vacillates. It never wavers. Why? Because he is God. Because he is the creator. Because he is the one who rose from the dead after offering his physical body as a sacrifice for our sin. So when I speak of hope from a biblical perspective, I'm talking about that which I desire to fully experience that I also have full confidence in, even if I haven't yet physically fully experienced it. My full confidence, then, is not based on dreams or wishes, but on the sure and eternal person and testimony of God. Catch this, because it's key. Faith, then, is assurance of something because it has been promised by a fully trustworthy source. Now, the second statement from verse 1 is very close in meaning. But the difference is it carries the ball a little bit further down the field toward the goal line. And the phrase that we're looking at now is where it says that faith is the conviction of things not seen. Now, this this is going to be so important to you. You want to really be attuned really tuned in here we've all heard it said have we not seeing is believing we've all heard that right and and many people they think that seeing is contrary to faith that if I can see it then faith isn't required so basically most people think of faith as being a blind leap into the dark Pastor John, whose last name I couldn't remember a second ago, I do remember that he mentioned that faith was something that could leap, right? I do at least remember that. But understand this, God never asks us to take a leap in the dark. He compels us, on the other hand, to take a leap into the light. Faith can leap, but it leaps leaps into the light, not into the dark. Let me show you that. God has chosen to give some people light, to give them revelation, to show them things that that we couldn't possibly know outside of his divine pulling back the curtain and showing the reality of something. And not only has he revealed revelatory light to certain people, but then he's given them the platform of the word of God to help us to be able to come into connection with that and to join into being able to see it just as they saw it. An example is found in first, it's actually second Peter. I got it wrong. Somebody corrected me in the first service. Thank God for the first service. They make things right for me. 
It's 2 Peter chapter 1, okay? So no matter what you see on the screen, it's 2 Peter, not 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 18, Peter writes, For we, speaking of him and his compadres, the disciples, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were what? Say it. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. They received light. They got to see it, touch it, experience it. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, quote, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased, end quote, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven and we were with him on the holy mountain what in the heck is paul talk, uh, peter talking about he's talking about that time when jesus took him and james and john up onto the mountain of transfiguration and the physical body of jesus gave way to the internal glory that was existing in him and they began to see jesus in a light they'd never seen him before and not only that then this cloud dropped down upon the mountain and this bright light was shining through that cloud and they heard the voice say This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And so God gave these men light. He gave them revelation. He gave them experience. Now, the problem with that to one degree is this. Is that if that's all there is, man can lie. Man can make up a story and lie to us, right? So Peter goes beyond to show us the next part of what God is doing in this light and revelation. Verse 19, 2 Peter chapter 1. And we, he says, have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. By the way, I just want to stop and say, see, see, God's not asking you to walk in the darkness. He wants to give you light. He doesn't want you to leap into the dark. He wants you to leap into the light. He's giving you a lamp that is shining in your darkness so that you can see the realities. And this is going to continue until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Verse 20, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of men. In other words, Scripture was not given to us by the will of men. But men spoke from God as they were carried along as they were borne along by the Holy Spirit. And the reality is this. I've never seen Jesus. I don't know. I'm pretty safe to think. I don't think any of you have seen Jesus either. But Peter saw him, and James saw him, And John saw him, thousands of people saw him, and the Holy Spirit comes along after giving that revelatory light and then superimposes it on the pages of God's word so that we then get included into that light and we now can see what is unseen through the eyes of faith. This is exactly what is being talked about in Hebrews 11.3 when it says this, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. How did things come to be? Well, you see, we weren't there. So how can we know? We have to know through the revelation of the Spirit of God as he moved men along to record the realities of what is going on behind the scenes. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God so that what is seen to us was not made out of things that are visible. So I say this to you, having made this case, that faith is not a leap in the dark as so many people think that is popular to understand, it is surrounded by all kinds of revelatory light. It is not wishing for something beyond reason, but it is laying hold of that which has been declared. Faith is stepping into the light to lay hold of that which has been declared so that we can live today in light of what is true in the realms where our physical senses cannot operate. So faith, faith is not a force that you tap into. 
It is not unreason, the unreasoned casting of your life to the wind, hoping it'll just all work out. No. <laughs> the simplest way to say it is, faith is trusting in God. Faith is trust in God. To take another step, I want to share with you a definition I believe God gave to me. As I was reading about faith, as I was praying about faith, as I was studying about faith, this is just my habit. I, I read up, I read up, I read up, and then I go let it kind of ferment in my brain. And so I took Harley for a walk. And I'm talking to God about what I've been reading, and all of a sudden, bam, this hits me. It's not that profound, but it hits me. What is faith? Faith is my full-weighted trust in the trustworthiness of God. That's what faith is. Faith is is my full-weighted trust in the trustworthiness of God. Now, I want to I I I I build on that just a bit here, and I need the chair to do it. A couple of thoughts. I've shared this with a couple of people, and they all come back. First question is, what do you mean by full-weighted? Okay, here's what I mean. I'm going to illustrate it for you. So full-weighted is this right here. This is full-weighted. You see this? Uh, there is no rope from the ceiling holding me. There is no safety net under this chair. There is nothing I can do. I have placed the entire weight. I've hedged nothing. I mean, I could just put my foot down kind of like this. If the chair gives way, I can jump up. I could maybe lean against the table. But this, my friends, is full weighted. And if this chair comes crashing down, I'm going to look like a real idiot and probably bust my tailbone bad. But this is full weighted in the trustworthiness of this chair. Now, how did I come to know the chair was trustworthy? Well, at some point in my life, I sat down in one and I kind of got the feel for what it was all about. And I've sat on these stools several times and I know they're trustworthy. See, I can even do this. <laughs> See, it's holding me. I mean, I'm not being slain in the spirit here. I mean, this is, this is, I'm just showing you how trustworthy the chair is. See, somebody's going to put that out on the internet and it's going to go viral. <laughs> pastor gets happy in the spirit. No, no, pastor's showing you an illustration. That's what he's doing, right? That's it. That's all I'm doing, right? Yeah. So when I talk then of faith being the full weighted trust in the trustworthiness of God just transpose what you just saw and laughed at from the chair to how you relate to the God who created you and you'll get it the full weight of everything that you are and everything that you have being placed in his hand Listen, trustworthiness, I forgot, I got to talk about that, trustworthiness, trustworthiness, the demonstrated proven track record of God, just like this chair has a proven demonstrated track record up to now, someday it may get bad and it might not be able to hold. But the proven, demonstrated track record of God. Let me tell you about that in my life. Truth time here. God has not given me everything I've asked for. I've asked him for a lot of things that he has said no. God has not shielded me from all pain. Twelve years ago, I was in a head-on collision. There was a lot of pain in that. And twelve years later, I still have the pain. That's why I don't have a motorcycle anymore, because it hurts to ride. And it's why I don't play golf unless somebody drags me out under shame. I don't go because it hurts. I still have pain. He has not shielded me from that. He has not shielded me from sickness. I have been sick throwing my guts up. Right? He's not shielded me from difficulty. He's not shielded me from depression. He's not shielded me from anxiety. 
He's not shielded me from these things. And listen to this. Mark this down, folks. And he never promised that he would. That's the problem with some of us. We got this mis guided thought that somehow God promised there'd be no pain in this world. No, my friend, if you read the Bible, you'll find that he promised there would be. In fact, he used himself as an illustration and said, if they treated me like dirt, what makes you think they won't treat you, my disciples, like dirt? He never promised that we wouldn't have challenges. But what I can tell you without any fear of contradiction, is that he has walked with me every step of the way. He has held my hand 24-7. He has provided everything I've ever needed to become whatever he wants me to be and to do whatever he asks me to do. I can tell you I have let myself down. I can tell you that you have let me down. I can tell you, though, that God has never let me down. His trustworthiness is without question. So based on 56 years of evidence of God's trustworthiness, I am learning, I am growing, I am maturing in placing the full weight of who I am and what I am and what I have into his hands. I am developing in my belief that what he says can be trusted, that his promises always hold true, that his wisdom will always guide me in the right way and will always come when asked for. And that in and through him, my physical eyes give way to the spiritual eyes of faith. And there are some things I can hope for with full confidence because he's the one who represents that thing. I put my faith in him. Therefore, I know he's got it covered. So there you have the introduction to the faith series. Chair and all. Don't get too excited about leaving just yet. Let me ask you this. Where do you stand in relationship? Where do you stand in relation to faith in your life? Where do you stand in relation to faith? Don't, you don't need to give me any, any, there's times I want reaction from you. Right now is not one, I'm, I'm not looking for anything. I just want you to think. Do you trust God? Let me give you something specific. That's too broad. Do you trust what he says about his son? What does he say about his son? Well, remember a few minutes ago, I made reference to Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. And remember, the cloud drops, the light shines, and the voice comes out saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He didn't stop there. He added, these other words listen to him listen to him do you believe what god has said about his son that 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 jesus about jesus that jesus is his son that god is well pleased in him and that we would be intelligent if we would really listen to him do you believe that if yes then we ask well what does jesus have to say and he has a lot to say But there's something that he said that's very definitive. Most of us have it memorized in here. It's recorded in the Gospel of John, chapter 14. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see, listen to me. If we trust God's testimony about Jesus, and we trust what Jesus has to say, then we will not look anywhere else than to Jesus for salvation. 
In other words, we will not try to make ourselves good. We will not try to make ourselves holy. We will not try to make ourselves righteous. Instead, we will trust in the righteousness of Jesus and the power of the Spirit of God to do that transformative work as opposed to trying to do it ourselves. Because that's what it means to have faith in him. That is what it means to trust him. I'm trusting that his righteousness, his blood, his death, his resurrection is what makes me right with the Father, not my good works or my good deeds. And so, have you trusted Jesus? Have you put the full weight of your eternity into his hands? Have you put the full bet on him making you right with the Father and not your religion? He's the only one. He's the only name that's been given among men whereby we must be saved. There's nowhere else to look. Don't look to me. Man, I'm going to disappoint you. And I'm sure I already have. Don't look to the church. Don't look to religion. He's the only one. Believer. Many of you are already believers. Many of you have trusted in Jesus. Many of you have looked to him. You have placed the full weight of your eternity in his hands. And you're my brothers and you're my sisters in Christ. You have trusted Jesus for salvation. But what about all the other things you need for everyday life? Is your faith in him there? Do you realize that there's only one way to live the Christian life? And that is by faith. There is no other way. Just as God is trustworthy in the area of salvation, so he's trustworthy in every other aspect of living. It's no secret that there's more of the older generation that attends the 9 o'clock service than attends this one, more younger people here. There are a few older ones, right? I'm one of them, right? But, and they, more so than the young ones, though the young ones can do it too, put a lot of stock in politics. And I challenge them with this question. I'm going to challenge you with it too because there's some political people in here too. But my question is simply this. Do you trust God with this election? <laughs> Here are a couple of snickers. Because you know, when you get behind closed doors with the brethren and the sistren, you hear a lot of talk that might lead you to believe they don't have much faith in divine in the divine plan. I'm in no way saying you shouldn't vote or you should. Absolutely, we have that right. Do it. Please do it. Don't not do it. Let me get that on the record. But listen, you can't put your faith in those politicians. You can't put your faith in those two parties. You can't put your faith in all that hype. Am I going to watch the debate tonight? I love a good circus. You better believe I'm going to be watching. <laughs> I want to see the clowns and the whole nine yards. The red meat and all of it, right? I mean, while the kids are having their uh, small group in my house, I'm going to be up in the bedroom watching, watching the circus. But look, what I, all I'm trying to say is this. Whether it's politics or whether it's the future of this church or the future of your job or the future of your family, your children, your grandchildren, where are you going to put your trust? Faith, your marriage? Faith is the full weighted trust in the trustworthiness of God. And I'll say this and then I'll pray and we're done. Trustworthiness takes time to, to, to understand. 
God's always been fully trustworthy. But my ability to see that is a growing thing. And there's some, man, all they can maybe do is just trust him for, uh, well, if I repent and trust, he'll save me. Um, and there's others who are able to trust for way more. It's a process. I get that. And that's part of the reason for the series is so that we can come up against this thing called faith and we can come up against the trustworthiness of God and we can see an example after example after example after example how against all odds in the most ridiculous, absurd circumstances, God has broken through and shown himself again and again and again and again and again ad nauseum to be trustworthy. And maybe through all of that, we as a body of believers together will learn to trust him more and more. And I'm not going to kick in (laughs) and give him our full weighted trust. Father, I pray that you'll take these things that have been shared this morning and that you'll use them according to your will in our lives. God, I know that in this crowd this morning are some some brothers and sisters in Christ who, uh, like I said, their faith has taken a beating and and they're hemorrhaging (laughs) faith. They don't. They don't know what ends up and what, what ends out and up and down. So God, I pray that you'll take these things that we look at in these passages and other passages we'll bring to bear and that you'll renew in us the understanding of your trustworthiness, of your sovereignty, of your power, of your wisdom, of your abilities, and, and that we will literally put the full weight of all that we are in your hands and walk with you and, and trust you to take us where you want us to be and where it is right for us to be. Restore people's faith that is taking a beating. I pray then for those who have yet to believe. Maybe they've come here today looking for answers. Um, In your own divine way, by your spirit, open up their, their hearts. Give them that gift of faith. Help them to see that Jesus is the only solution. May today be the day they turn from sin and turn to him. And put the full weight of their eternity in his hands. Give us an opportunity to pray with them, to minister to them, to disciple them and help them to grow in that faith, I pray. In all things, may we walk by faith here on earth and not by sight. Teach us to trust. Thank you for this time. Bless these people as they go about their day. And I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. My wife and I are here. We want to pray with you. We want to help you in any way we can. God bless. Have a great day. Enjoy it. I think it's going to be a beautiful one. Have a great time. We'll see you tonight, hopefully at five.